Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. Um, I hope you guys have been enjoying the videos. I literally am having so much fun doing this. So the comments from you guys have been amazing. The support has been amazing and I cannot tell y'all how much I appreciate it. Like you literally have no idea the ones that are really taking their time to give me detailed comments. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I cannot thank y'all enough. It is so encouraging. It makes me literally wanna keep going. Obviously, I don't get paid for this because I don't have enough, you know, subscribers and all of that yet. So the fact that you guys take the time to help me like perfect this and tweak it cannot thank you enough ever. OK, I love you guys and I appreciate it so much. Today, we're going to jump into a true crime story. I get really excited with these because sometimes the version that you guys see on the media is so vastly different from the person that I knew in prison. Today's story is going to be about a young girl named Rachel Wade. Now, this young lady was all over the news, all over the media. It was this teenage love triangle gone horribly wrong. And there were some aspects that I think were very on point and some that I think were very off. I personally do not have a super grand opinion of this individual for my own reasons, which I will tell you guys, but I want you guys to hear this story so you can kind of decide for your own self what it is that you think you know, was just and what was fair and what wasn't in her punishment and in the whole story in general, okay? So, Rachel Wade was born February 27th, 1990 to Janet and Barry Wade in Pinellas Park, Florida. And it's just an area where a lot of people know each other. She was, you know, her parents were loving. She was, by all accounts, a fairly good kid. But once she got into her teenage years, she did the regular rebelling type of things. She wanted to rebel. She wanted to be on her own. She wanted to make her own rules. She was known for running away. She was known for trying to stay out late, sneak out, date boys, and do all of the things that traditionally teenagers do, okay? And this is when there were the first signs of maybe some turbulence. I'm not going to say trouble because she didn't do anything to actually get in, like, legal trouble. But there was a little bit of some rough patches going on here her parents kind of started to notice. So they tightened the reins a little bit because even though Barry and Janet weren't, you know, super affluent family, they were loving, they wanted her, their daughter to do well, they wanted her to succeed in life, and they just wanted the best for her. So they really were trying to tighten the reins to steer her in the right direction. As Barry and Janet started to tighten the reins more on Rachel, she kind of seemed to become more defiant. When she was 15, she was found in the school parking lot with a boy that was 19. He was actually charged with a sexual offense for that crime. And even though it was, you know, something that they both wanted to do, um, he was still over 18 and she was only 15. Now, you're going to see a lot of points in Rachel's life where you can see that she vastly craves attention, wants to be loved, wants to feel validated, is a severe, severe people pleaser, and just always wants to be the cool one, the one that everyone likes. She really is going to show that even in her crime but really guys i want y'all to know that i saw that even still to this day in prison when i was leaving and i was going home i still saw that rachel had that very 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 deep dynamic where she wants to people please she wants to be liked she wants everyone to want her and to need her and she will go to vast lengths to get people to want her to like her and to need her and it's just something that I'm not sure if psychologically she's lacking from her family I'm not sure if it's something that's just in the way she's you know biologically wired as far as we know, nothing was, you know, traumatic in Rachel's childhood. There's no documentation of any kind of crises or traumas or anything that happened to her. So by all accounts, she was very much a well-rounded kid that got everything she needed from her parents. However, she still always seemed to crave, lack, and desire that validation from anybody particularly boys so at this point when this boy gets in trouble her mom janet is called and they go home she picks her up they go home she has a fight with her mom janet she apparently had like a whole meltdown because her mom was trying to punish her and you know maybe ground her or something along those lines and she runs and locks herself in the bathroom 
There are some conflicting reports that she grabbed a knife and ran to the bathroom. She may have because there were some times in prison when she was known to have cut herself. Um, she wasn't heavily into self-mutilation as far as I knew, but I know that she has cut herself and she has done that. But I always felt like it was a means for her to get attention while she was in prison when she did it. As far as when she was at home that day, I don't know if she grabbed a knife or not. Either way, we know that she had a meltdown and a blowout fight with her mom after she was caught with that boy and she ran into the bathroom and locked herself in there. Her mother started to investigate what the heck was going on with her daughter. Why at 15 years old was she all of a sudden seeming to break down and you know kind of go into this this weird phase where she was shutting them out and just not do well and become distant and attached. And she quickly started to learn that Rachel was boy crazy. She would do literally anything to get a boy's attention. She would do anything to get a boy to like her. And she was just going to great lengths to be accepted and popular. Once Rachel would actually gain the attention and affection of whoever the boy was, she would go to no ends to keep him. She would do anything to keep him, to keep him happy, to keep him interested in her. Yet somehow her relationships would all seem to have the same ending. It would be a volatile breakup where it ended on bad terms and the boy would seemingly want no parts of Rachel or her life wanted to completely cut ties with her and have a clean break from her. Nobody really knows why, but people were starting to get a sense of a clingy, stage five stalkery, you know, always there when you turn around, like with the plate of cookies type of vibe, right? And it was creeping people out. So they were, you know, these boys that were her age and a little older, and they would like her at first because she was really cool and really down and always there for whatever, you know, that ride or die down type of girl. But suddenly you would see these boys running for the hills and want no parts of her and she would be chasing right behind them. That is all figuratively speaking, not literally, but I just want you guys to get in the mindset and get an idea of what this looks like, okay? So now we're gonna fast forward to her sophomore year. Rachel's sophomore year of high school, she ran away 14 times, okay? After running away 14 times, her parents were at their wits end and she finally just dropped out of school. Her parents felt like there was really nothing they could do at this point. So she dropped out of school and she spent her time working in a doggy daycare. Her parents got her into counseling, y'all, but you know, when a child, and I know some of you can relate, and I know that I went through a phase where I wanted to just totally rebel and do what I wanted. But for those of you that can relate, when you put your child into counseling, like, they're going to tell the counselor one of two things, either whatever they want to hear to get the heck out of there or the truth in which the counselor is going to try to find the root of the trauma and fix the person, fix the individual, right? When we both know that those textbook diagnosis and those textbook therapies and all of that, I mean, do they really work when you're a teenager? Like how many times have we really seen it work, y'all? Let's be real, right? So nonetheless, Rachel is going to these counseling sessions, working at the doggy daycare, and not going to school like she should. So at this point, her parents thought, okay, things might be finally going okay, right? But she ended up running away, going to live with a guy before her 17th birthday. It was about a month before her 17th birthday. She lives with this guy. She moves in with him. It's her boyfriend. And her parents are kind of like, okay, she's really about to be 17. She's dropped out of school. We cannot control her. And guys, I'm a parent of a nine-year-old, so I'm like nowhere near in the mindset of this. I know I personally would not let my child at 17 years old or almost 17, especially a girl, go live with an older guy in an apartment. But I also cannot relate to how they were feeling because they were probably really at their wits end. And maybe you guys out there, the parents, the moms that have had kids that have gone through this can tell me how you felt if there's a point when you just say like, I surrender, I give up, do whatever the heck you want. I can't imagine that I would ever feel that way, but I know there has to be a point as a human being, you know, because you're a parent, but you're a human being also, where you are just full. You know, you're, you're at the level, your bin is full of emotion, of, you know, 
anger of just you're just desperate. You're desperate and you're 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 done. You're you're at your wit's end. You know what else can you say? And at that point, what do you do, right? So, I'm going to assume that Janet and Barry, her parents, were at their wit's end. And when she went to live with this guy, they were like, how much more can we chase? Go. Just freaking go. So, there are multiple times when the police were reported to have been called to this apartment of this young man and Rachel. And there were domestic dispute after domestic dispute after domestic dispute. I will also touch on that because Rachel has a history of prison relationships where she was in domestic dispute after domestic dispute. She is really, y'all, and I'm telling you this because I'm going to get to how I know her very well at the end, but she likes this. It's, it's her, it's almost like she cannot function in an element where everything is normal and copacetic. If there is not chaos, if there is not some kind of tension, if there is not some tussling back and forth, she is not comfortable. She doesn't like it. And it's almost like she'll self-sabotage and create it because I watched her go into relationship after relationship in prison and literally always have the same outcome, always end up fighting with these girlfriends. All, like it was nonstop the whole nine years I was in there with her. But we will get there. Back to the story, okay? So the police are being called after time, after time, after time. So finally, the relationship ran its course and she went back home. Around her 18th birthday, she said, enough is enough. I completely want out. Now I can legally be out. And let me remind you guys again, there is no reason for this. By her own account, right out of her mouth, and by her parents' account, and by all documentation, there is no reason for Rachel to ever want to have, you know, this like really super eager feeling that she has to leave except for that she does not want to follow any rules and she does not like authority she wants to do what she wants to do and that is it period point blank her parents never did anything to her she never had anything happen to her she literally just wants to do her own thing and part of her own thing involves a lot of boys. When she turns 18, she gets a job as a server or a waitress at Applebee's. Now, mind you guys, she's been working at that doggy daycare for the summers. She's been working, you know, so she's been saving money. She doesn't have any bills at her parents' house. Her life is actually pretty decent. And she is able to get herself an apartment very shortly thereafter. So once she gets her apartment, she's also able to get a car. And by all means, like, a car, an apartment, when you're 18, paying your bills is a pretty good thing. Like, this is somebody who could be a good, productive member of society, but she still had that boy craze thing where she just wanted to be accepted and liked by everybody. And when you're 18 and you have these things that put you in a power position, like your own place and your own car, you're going to attract a lot of leeches. And we all know that. Because when you're 18 and you have your own things, there's going to be a lot of people who don't have those things that want to crash at your place, bum off of your car, take, get rides with your gas money, stuff like that. And we all know that to be true, right? So, of course, she was going to attract that kind of crowd. And with her wanting to be a people pleaser, be accepted and be wanted and liked by everybody, that was a recipe for disaster. You guys can already see the horror coming. So, nonetheless, she is working at Applebee's, paying her bills. She did not graduate from high school, but her parents just wanted her, her to be healthy, happy, and safe. So, for right now, it was okay. She was doing okay. She, one day, goes to a party, and she meets a boy named Joshua Camacho. She remembers Joshua because she did go to elementary school with him, but she really didn't ever like hang out with him, become close with him or anything like that. But she did remember him. He was kind of like one of the bad boys and he always kind of was a little bit more in the rough crowd. OK, so she sees him at a party. Sparks fly. He finds out that, you know, she has her own place. She has her own car. So, of course, his antennas peak. And he's interested, right? Because now he's seeing cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. I got all this stuff. This girl is pretty because she's a very pretty girl. 
got her own place, got her own car. He's a senior at Pinellas Park High School. So he's seeing all kinds of advantages to being with her. But he also is dating somebody else that is not in the picture at all, but he does end up having a baby with this girl at a very young age. He also is dating at the same time a girl named Sarah Ludeman, who he met while he was working his Chick-fil-A job over the summer. He did actually meet Rachel first, but was on again, off again with her. And when she found out about the other girls, she didn't know who the other girls really were. So Rachel was dating him and he met Sarah along the way somewhere. And basically, he's just dating all of them, having his cake and eating it too. She knows he's doing other things and she's like, okay, I'm done with this, you know what I mean? But then again, she keeps going back over and over. I'm not gonna shame her for that because that happens quite often. Men are very good at finessing and manipulating and reeling you back in with their charm. So I can't say anything about her in that aspect, but she did know that he was a total douchebag like he was totally just like screwing them all over so anyways now he ended up meeting the victim who is named sarah ludeman and he ended up meeting her one day at chick-fil-a it was his summer job he was working there i guess he walked out she was there with her friends he saw her he gave her like the old little wink and I guess she was totally like smitten at that point. She just went head over heels because he did that little move and whatever. They like flirted all summer. And Sarah was actually a good girl with great grades who wanted to be a veterinarian. So shifting a little to tell you about her now. She was in a good private school. She had great grades. She had good aspirations. But when she met Josh and flirted that whole summer with him, same time he was also dating the baby's mama that he was with and he was also dating rachel okay so he meets her and somehow convinces her to switch from her good private school to his public school pinellas park high school she tells her parents that she does not want to be a veterinarian anymore she does not want to go to the school she's going to anymore she now wants to switch to the public school pinellas park high school at this point, if I was her parents, I would be like, no, you're not switching. You're staying right where your butt's at. And that's that. Like, no, you're not about to mess up your life for this boy. Because they knew, and they said by their accounts, they knew that it was because of this boy. Nonetheless, even though she was taking an hour bus ride every day in the dark to go to this private school just so she could attend their veterinary program, and she was about to be in the last year, she went ahead and transferred to Pinellas Park Public High School, gave up her dreams and everything for this boy, okay? Now, while she was attending school, the first couple months really sucked for her, guys, because guess what Josh did? He literally ignored her. He would walk by her in the hall and maybe give her a nod and like some eye contact, but he acted like he did not know who she was. He didn't give her any attention. He didn't give her any affection. He didn't do anything. But when they were in private, he was really loving, really like affectionate, really all over her. And it was starting to get to her. So finally, he decided to publicly claim her and give them a title. But even then, you guys, he wouldn't even hold her hand in public. He wouldn't do anything with her that really resembled what a relationship would look like, okay? And this was very bothersome. But remember, because this was her first relationship, she was like very smitten and she was accepting of all this BS, okay? Now, while he's doing that during the day in school, he's still with Rachel. He's on again, off again with her. He is still doing things that make her mad and she's still breaking up with him every so often, but he's still going over to her house. She still has attracted this leech of a guy and he is still using her for her apartment and her car and you know, for sex as well because they're hooking up. So he's having the best of both worlds. But eventually Sarah's friends started to notice that she started to become a little withdrawn and a little detached and basically was acting weird. One thing they noticed and they noted in particular 
was that because, you know, they live in Florida, Sarah would wear shorts all of the time. Even in the winter, y'all, she would wear shorts, but she started to wear pants. And she ended up telling her friends when they questioned her that she was wearing pants because Josh did not want any other guys to look at her legs. Okay. Moving right along. He also started to dictate who she could and could not hang out with. So now Josh was putting all these rigorous and outlandish demands on Sarah, okay? And she was following, guys. She was literally following. Like, he had his teeth and his claws and this hold on both of these young ladies. He had it on Sarah because it was her first relationship and she didn't know any better. It was a world when it was new, it was attractive. It was something that made her feel in a way that she'd never felt. You guys remember what that first love is like, right? Like it's crazy, it's ridiculous. You feel things you've never felt and you think that you'll never feel that again. So she was willing to adhere to all these dumb rules that this guy had because she didn't think she was ever gonna find love like that again. Then he had his hooks and his claws and his hold on Rachel because he was just really, really feeding into this sickness that she had where whenever, just like I told y'all before, whenever she would get with somebody, she did not want to let them go. She would use any means and any tactics to keep them with her. Okay, so she was pulling out all the stops to keep Josh around. Josh literally had zero zilch, nothing to offer either one of these girls. But because they both had their issues and their reasons for wanting to hold on to him, they both kept trying and fighting for this douchebag. Sarah cannot imagine life without Josh. She can't fathom it. It's just really foreign to her. And Rachel has this weird thing where she has to keep everybody that she becomes entangled with there. She, Rachel has this thing and she still does it to this day. God, she still did it in prison, y'all. She literally is like, has like a clingy stalker vibe. She has to keep you there and it is like some fatal attraction type stuff. I'm not even kidding y'all. It really is that type of vibe, okay? So Josh has both of these girls in a prime place because they're both feeding in to his ego and his pride and all his BS manly stuff that he's feeling all that testosterone that's inside they're fueling it for him okay so rachel is working at applebee's and sarah is going to school josh is barely acknowledging sarah at school but he is hanging out with her every day until 11 o'clock when her curfew is up because that is when he has to leave from hanging out with her and he goes right on and just goes to rachel's because she usually doesn't get off work till after 11 goes to her apartment hooks up with her, spends a night, eats up her food, drives her car, and hangs out. So he's living the life. He's, you know, doing his thing, mooching and leeching and sucking off of everybody. Sarah started to show some really funky signs of a shift, okay? Her first relationship started to show signs of maybe a, like more of an obsession, and that is from her friend's perspective. Now, Sarah's parents said that in the first six months of their relationship, their daughter, Sarah, who had never been in trouble, was actually spoken to by the police and contacted by the police in regards to several different conflicts and confrontations that involved their daughter, Sarah, right? Some of them were domestic disputes between her and Josh. Some of them were confrontations between Josh's baby's mama, the other lady, I think her name was Annie, the one that's not really in the picture, and Sarah, the new girlfriend. And some were between Sarah and just some other random girls that Josh was hooking up with and cheating on her with. But nonetheless, you can see a pattern now where Sarah is really starting to direct her anger and her, you know, her fire towards these other women that Josh is cheating with instead of directing it towards Josh, who is totally showing to be a cheating, lying scumbag. OK, but at this point, neither girl knew about each other. Rachel didn't know about Sarah and Sarah didn't know about Rachel. It was easy to keep them apart because of that thing I told y'all about, which was the curfew and the job. Because of the curfew and the job, they didn't know about each other, but soon that would start to change and it was all going to be because of social media. The platform MySpace, I'm sure y'all remember it, um, but that platform was actually going to bring everything to a head and bring everything to the forefront so that both girls could quickly find out about each other.
So one day on MySpace, Sarah actually posts this picture of her and Josh. When Rachel sees that picture, she comments under the picture and says, I thought I was so in love with you. I loved you so much, but now I deserve better. And that is not verbatim. I'm not quoting that. That was just the idea of the message, okay? After Sarah sees that message, she replies to that comment directly and says, he has found better. And, you know, of course, she is referring to herself. This infuriates Rachel. Now she is very angry because now Sarah has gone from a girl that he is cheating with because he's cheated many a times on Rachel and Rachel knows about numerous other girls. But now Sarah has become a person that she can direct her anger towards, okay? Sarah has already been directing her anger directly at other women, but Rachel has just been breaking up and getting back together with Josh every time she finds out about a new girl. But now, because of this interaction on MySpace, based on this picture, now both girls have their sights set on each other, and now they are going to start going for each other directly, okay? So, after that, somehow, because Pinellas Park is a very small little area where everybody that's the same age kind of knows each other, now Rachel goes and does a little investigating and finds out Sarah's phone number. When she finds out Sarah's phone number, y'all, she starts literally, like, attacking, harassing and threatening message after message after message after text after voicemail. I mean, just to no end, to the point that Sarah even called the police one time and said that Rachel had called her over 20 times in a two-hour period, leaving threatening message after threatening message. In retaliation to that, Sarah gets together with her friends, and she goes to Rachel's job at Applebee's, sits in her section, tells Rachel's manager that Rachel has spit in their food, which we know wasn't true, or maybe it was, but it probably wasn't. They try to trip Rachel while she's carrying a tray of food and drinks, which didn't work either. And when Rachel goes to her car, they pull up, run out, and spray her with a bunch of silly string. Rachel did report that part to the police because they, you know, they had run up on her and she was a little scared. But this was all documented in police reports, okay? So, all of this had gone on and there was a lot of back and forth. So if y'all are not already sitting down, let me please implore you to sit down at this point because I am now going to tell you what Josh was telling the two girls about each other, okay? Y'all ready for this? Josh, du aka Doucher, was actually telling the two girls that each was his ex-girlfriend of like the past year, like very recent ex-girlfriend, right? So he was telling Rachel that Sarah was his ex from a year ago, and he was telling Sarah that Rachel was his ex from a year ago. And he was telling them both that they were both crazy and that they were both like stalker, okay? They were both a little acting a little stalkerish, but that's because Josh was feeding them all this bullshit. So Sarah thought that Rachel was his ex that just would not let go and was crazy and just, you know, wouldn't give him up. And Rachel thought that Sarah was his ex that was crazy and just wanted him and would not give him up. And whenever they would question him about recent photos that were being posted, he said that it was just the other one's ploy to break them up and cause them trouble. And they bought this BS. They bought this shit, y'all. Like, and again, I'm not going to shame anyone because guys can really really, you know, finesse you sometimes. And this was one's first love. And then the other one was just, she was just batshit crazy about keeping the people that she had. So they both had equally, I'm not going to say bad or strange, but they both had an equal set of issues that made them want to keep Josh close. Okay. Nonetheless, Josh still had absolutely zilcho to offer either one. By right, both of them should have moved right on because Rachel was pretty, had her own place, had her own car, had her own job, had her own money, was promiscuous, flirty, and wanted to please her man with no limits in sight. So she would do anything to keep him happy. And, you know, Sarah was pretty educated on her way to a good future 
good family, and basically just an all-around wholesome girl. So, you know, by right, both of them could have moved on and had whoever they wanted, but they kept sticking with this doucher. Sorry I keep calling him doucher, y'all, but he aggravates me. He's gross. He's a douchebag. Really pisses me off, and he grosses me out. You had absolutely no right to have both of these girls fighting over you. And the stuff that he's going to do a little later in the video is really going to piss y'all off. I know it is because it pissed me off. And I know a lot of you are like me and I, I feel it through your comments. So I know it's going to piss y'all off. But nonetheless, he is doucher. Now, if you didn't sit down when I told you to a few minutes ago, you might really want to sit down now. Because at this point, Josh... The size of his balls just go, they grow to like infinity. This douche has the audacity in the midst of all this chaos that he's creating with these two very naive girls to move in with Rachel. So he literally moves in with Rachel and is sleeping with her every single night while every single day going to school and still seeing Sarah and still making Sarah believe that they are in a full-blown, committed, and monogamous relationship, y'all. And they both buy it, but only for so long because, as you know, social media platforms will air out your dirty laundry and hang them on a nice, pretty reel for everyone to sniff. So, of course, soon they found out. And to be honest, this is another reason I call him a douche is because... He literally told several of his friends who went on record to say that he said he liked it. He liked that the girls fought over them. He actually told them to their face, hey, you know what? If y'all really love me and you really want to be with me, you guys will fight. You'll duke it out over me. I like it and whoever wins will get me. May the best woman win. Like he he actually said that. I don't know who made who. Who told him or made him think that he was king dingling? You have nothing going for yourself. Like, get it together. Uh, pisses me off. But anyways, yeah, that's what he said, y'all. That's literally what he told his friends. So now, guys, you know, the girls know about each other. Things are really heating up. I gotta say that the police went on record and both sets of parents went on record and said that they really thought this was just some silly teen rivalry and it would fizzle out eventually. And to be honest, I would have probably thought the same thing if I was in any of those positions. But unfortunately, nobody took it serious enough because it was getting really heated and people were thinking it was going to fizzle out, but it was just getting more and more intense, y'all, and nobody was paying it close enough attention. And just to let you know what was kind of going on in the mindset that at least Rachel was in, these are some of the recordings and some of the messages that Rachel left on Sarah's voicemail while Josh and her were messing around and while Sarah and Josh were also messing around, okay? Please tell me, Sarah, why you would be a dumb enough to, to put a brand new picture of you and Josh at the beach. Seriously, I told you to watch your back and not to chill with him. Now your ass is mine and I'm guaranteeing you I'm going to murder you. I'm letting you know that now because you know what? Josh might have played me, but bitch, I'm going to play your ass out too. Watch. You're a fat bitch and I'm going to kill you. I swear on my life. Watch out your window when I get off work tonight, you dumb bitch. End of message. Keep playing f***ing games. You're a pathetic little bitch and you're a little f***ing girl. Honestly, what the f*** do you have that's going for you that Josh wants you over me for? I got a job, have my own place, have, what the f***? Seriously? He could get anything he wants from me. Any f thing. Not to mention that I look probably ten times better than you. And you f***ing run your Next message. It's so funny how you talk and you want to sit there and say that my man was at your house? Then tell me what he was wearing tonight, Sarah. You're a dumb bitch for real. If you're f***ing lying, I'm going to find you and I'm going to beat your ass. If you're not lying, I'm going to find you and beat your ass, okay? You, you still got your mommy and daddy's curfew, bitch, for God's sake. What the f*** do you, why do you run your f***ing mouth and why are you that pathetic? Please do leave shit on your MySpace because that's old news just like you and him are. So keep talking Sarah. You don't know when to stop, you haven't learned your lesson yet, but I'm going to teach you it. I'm telling you now, keep with me, Sarah. The f***ing dumb with me, Sarah. The f***ing dumb, psychotic little bitches. And I'm telling you now, I'm going to show you psycho. Keep with me. You're with the wrong person, and 
with the one thing that I care about. So keep f***ing going, Sarah. Play your mother f***ing game, because I'm going to teach you how to grow up real mother f***ing quick. End of message. Now, guys, clearly, clearly, okay, she said some really bad stuff. And I know that there have been days when I've said some crazy stuff that I meant figuratively, not literally, okay? There have been times, and you guys, tell me if I'm wrong. I mean, have you guys not ever been to the point where you've said, oh, I hate her so much, I wish she would just die, or I'm so mad I could just kill you. I'm so mad I could just rip her head off. Dang, I wish I could just punch her in the face. Man, if he was in front of me, I would just run him over. Like, you know what I'm saying? You, I know there's a lot of times, y'all correct me if I'm wrong, but there's times when you had to have said some of those things in the moment and just meant them figuratively speaking, not literally. But coincidentally, some of the things that she said happened to the T the way she said it. Do I feel like she went and plotted and planned and executed and premeditated this murder? Absolutely not. Do I feel like Rachel is a complete whack job? Yes, I do. And I will tell y'all why when I get to the prison stories that I have regarding her because her and I, we went through it. Her and I went through it. But nonetheless, back to the story. She said these things, and even though their anger should have been directed at Josh, the douchebag, for cheating and lying to both of them, it wasn't. Their anger was directed and fueled right at each other, and it was getting really intense and really heated. And you know what? These messages were really used in court to prove a point because it does look really bad. But I really, in my heart, believe it was just her talking a whole lot of shit, trying to look big and bad and tough, because I watched her do that in prison on several occasions when she was doing the same crap that she did to get there, which was fighting over relationships. Because, you know, there's obviously relationships in prison, and I will get to that when I get to the prison part. But nonetheless, at this point, you know, Josh was living with Rachel Sarah was pissed off with him. He was still going to school with her. He was still, you know, trying to romance her during the day and all of this stuff. But she was she was pissed and she was fed up to the point that her parents said that she lost 30 pounds in a few week period. She was crying herself to sleep every night over this freaking loser. And she was really, really just upset and heartbroken about what was going on with Josh and Rachel. Now, one day she came home from school after about a two week period and she logged into MySpace and she saw a picture of Rachel and Josh and the caption read, loving my boo. That was verbatim, loving my boo, right? So this really, really tore her heart. Sarah was just very, very upset. So she ends up texting Josh. This is what she says and I quote, Whatever, Josh, you get so mad at me for everything. But you don't give a shit when she says something or puts something up. You always believe her. A few minutes later, she texts again and she says, quote, it's like no matter what I do, she's always just that much better, end quote. She then continued with one more text, quote, all we fight about is her or something that has to do with her. And it sucks. I hate fighting with you because I love you so much, but this shit hurts end quote. She waited for hours and hours and Sarah heard nothing back from Josh. So now she's really torn. Her heart is really hurting. So she sends out one last text to him and she says, quote, you say you love me, but you don't even have the decency to text me back, end quote. So finally, a little after eight, Josh texts her back and says to Sarah, simply bring the movies. That's all he says, okay? So, now Sarah has the green light that he wants to hang out. But unfortunately, he already had plans to hang out with Rachel that night, okay? Now, yes, they were living together, but he also was going back and forth to his sister Janet's house. His sister Janet is older. She has her own little place. And guys, get this, everybody, Rachel, Sarah, Janet, all live in like this seven block radius. I, that's not an exact figure, but I'm just saying like they all live within a few blocks of each other. Okay. So now that Josh is living with Rachel, 
it does not mean that he does not still bounce around to Janet's house and back to his mom's, okay? So he hangs out at Janet's a lot because he doesn't have any rules. His life's never had discipline or structure. He does whatever he wants, and he just goes wherever he wants. So when she gets this message, and Sarah reads it, and it says, bring the movies, he has told her now that she can come hang out with him at his sister Janet's house. But since he already made plans with Rachel that night, he had a problem. So since he already had plans with Rachel that night and she was very excited about it, remember she had just put a picture up saying loving my boo earlier that day, he had a little bit of a problem because now he has text one, bring the movies, and he's got plans with the other. So he flakes on Rachel and tells her, sorry, can't hang out, got other plans. Very short, very cold, and really pisses her off, right? So Sarah gets her mom's minivan. She is allowed to use it because she's been a fairly good student and good kid from you know the beginning of her life up until she met Josh. There's no reason her parents can't let her use the car and she's only going down the street to watch movies with her friends which is what she tells them. So she gets in the minivan and she's driving to meet Josh. As she's driving to meet Josh she happens to decide to swing by Rachel's apartment complex because she's feeling good now. She's like, she's the one on top, right? She's pumped up and she's puffed up. So Rachel happens to be outside walking her dog. So she rolls down the window and Sarah yells at Rachel and says, stay away from my man and pulls off. Now this makes Rachel feel weird and kind of uncomfortable, but she's not really sure what's going on. So she continues to walk the dog, and Sarah goes on and goes to Janet's house. Janet, Joshua, and Sarah all hang out at Janet's house. There's also another friend over there named Dustin Grimes. He's hanging out as well. So they're all hanging out, watching movies, and playing video games well into the night, okay? Now rewind a little bit to when Rachel was walking her dog and Sarah drove by and screamed at her, okay? Sarah screamed that at her and it made Rachel uncomfortable. She was kind of like freaked out by it. So she went inside and called her friend Javier. Javier was someone she used to mess with and kind of like an ex-boyfriend sort of situation way before Joshua, okay? And so she calls him and she tells him, hey, you know, she drove by, she yelled something out the window. I don't know if she's still around. I don't know what's going on. I'm kind of weirded out. And so Javier says, you know what, just come on over to my house. So she says, okay, cool. So she goes in the kitchen, she grabs like a steak knife. It's not a super crazy sharp, big steak knife, but it's a steak knife, kind of like out of a butcher block or something. Um, she grabs that, she puts it in her purse because she feels creeped out and she walks out to her car and she decides she's going to Javier's house, okay? What kind of knife is it? Just like something you'd get out of a, like a butcher block kind of thing? What does it look like? Can you describe it? It just had a black handle on it and, and it's about that long. A serrated edge? Yeah. Okay. When now, as she's going to Javier's house, it dawns on her that, okay, Joshua has flaked on me. This girl drove by and yelled, stay away from my man. We all live in the same general area. Let me go by Janet's house and see if I see that same green minivan that she was driving, that Sarah was driving, parked at Janet's. Because then, you know, I'll know what's going on. It's going to be obvious. Josh is at his sister Janet's, hanging out with Sarah, who's driving the green minivan, and that's why he flaked on me earlier, right? So she drives by, and it really baffles me, y'all, why she decided to even do that. I understand if you want to try to put the pieces of the puzzle together and figure out why she was driving by your house and see if there's a chance that it's maybe because she was on her way to hang out with Josh, who flaked on you but can only be so many places. So one of them might be a sister's Janet. So it, I can understand how she might want to put all the pieces together and say, let me drive by there and see if I see this car there, because then I'll know what's going on. But what I don't understand is she was scared enough to where she wanted to vacate her house. She wanted to leave and go to her friend Javier's to actually find some safety because she was that scared to be in her house alone. So if you're that scared to be in your house alone, why would you take it upon yourself to alone drive by the person that you're scared of or so you say by the place where they might be okay 
but maybe she didn't think she would find Sarah there. So maybe that's why she drove by there. Maybe she was going to drive by there and try to say something to Josh. But then she saw the green van and she, you know, got mad. Nonetheless, we don't know, but she, we know she drove by there and she saw the green minivan. When she sees the green minivan, she texts Josh a message that says this, quote, Now I know why you're not talking to me. Because you have her, end quote. So Josh, who's inside with his sister Janet, Janet's friend Dustin, and Sarah, sees the text and responds to Rachel and says, quote, that's right, I don't like you no more. So when Rachel reads this at this point, because remember, she has left her house with a knife because she's scared to be home alone. At this point, by right, she should have left and just been done with it her senses should have kicked in she should have been like you're a piece of douche and i'm out of here or she should have had some fear like she had earlier but she didn't because that text infuriated her and lit a fire in her that had the adrenaline kick in and she actually started riding up and down the street screaming and yelling and honking and texting and saying all kinds of things basically all of it was directed towards Sarah and she was trying to get Sarah from inside that house to come out and physically fight her she was calling her out repeatedly to come out and fight her Sarah did not come out. Nobody responded to any of her call outs or any of her threats. They didn't say anything. But in the midst of this, it is now, hours have gone by and it is now like well after 11, closer to midnight and it's past Sarah's curfew. So her father texts her and says, hey, what's up? When? When are you coming home? But he only texts the word when. And Sarah's like, oh crap, I have to go. Let me, you know, get out of here. And she texts her dad and says she's coming home right now. So she looks out the window, her and Josh check and make sure that, you know, Rachel's not loony tuning it behind a bush somewhere, ready to pop out and do anything crazy. And they don't see her. So she gets in the mom's minivan and she goes ahead and she decides she's going to go home. But Dustin and Janet run out real quick and say, hey, hold on. Can you please take us to McDonald's real quick? And even though she is already so late for her curfew and it's already there's just so much craziness going on because I guess Janet is the sister of the guy and apparently she's probably a mooch and a leech too because this is a freaking 16, 17 year old girl that is late for her curfew and needs to go home and is already in trouble and like you're old enough to have your own place but you really still want her to drive you at midnight to McDonald's to get food? Like, come on, man. Call a freaking Uber. So, of course, you know, Rachel was the one that always wanted to people please. But at this point, I guess Sarah probably felt like, okay, Josh is giving me the chance. You know, I'm the winner. I'm the one. Because when you have someone that makes you feel like you need to fight for them and you're the one that's coming out on top at that moment you want to do everything to keep that going right so she doesn't want to say no to the sister of the guy that she's trying to get the approval from and please so yeah she said yeah and she took janet to the mcdonald's she took her and justin her friend to the mcdonald's so as uh sarah, as sarah is driving justin and janet are in the van they pull up at the McDonald's, which apparently is like right around a couple blocks away too. Like everything is in this remote little area. And they see another friend of theirs who knows all parties involved. And they start talking about what had happened earlier. And that friend tells them that they saw Rachel at Javier's house earlier. So at this point, nobody should have gave a damn. Nobody should have cared where Rachel was or anything like that. You know, Sarah's supposed to be on her way home and Janet and Dustin need to take their butts back to their house and just keep on doing whatever the heck they're doing, right? But no, of course, I don't know who am to up or what happened, but somehow, you know, there were some, some things going on that got Sarah all hyped up and she ended up on the phone with Rachel while they were in the McDonald's parking lot. I don't know who called whom or how that happened. I have a gut feeling and this is only my gut feeling. There's not anything that has ever been said to prove this or back it up, but I have a gut feeling like Janet and her brother Joshua were more like, like kind of ratchet, like, um, just like ratchet, you know, y'all know what ratchet means, right? Like kind of like loud and rowdy and wild and like, don't give a damn and, 
you know, F the police and all that type of mindset, you know, the real just like ignorant acting mindset. I have a feeling that they were like that. And I have a feeling that they were like that based on several things that I haven't told you on the story and I'm not going to because it's just going to waste a lot of time. But I have a feeling that possibly when they were in that car, had Sarah been by herself at the McDonald's and someone told her that, I don't think she would have now on her way home and already being in trouble for being late from curfew, I don't think she would have gone to Javier's. But I have a feeling that Janet was in the car hyping her up and boosting her up to, you know, like, oh, hell no, she's at Javier's. We need to go over there and say something like, yeah, we know where she's at. Let's go handle this type of thing. I think Janet was really, really pushing her up to go over there and confront, you know, the situation with Rachel. So I feel like that's how she ended up there. I could be totally wrong. Let me say that. But I just feel like that, okay? So, however it happens, they end up on the phone together. And it is said by Justin and Janet, they are the only people saying this. And Rachel has disputed it, but whatever. So, we'll never know. But I'm just telling y'all for the purpose of telling you what the jury heard during the trial. Because the jury heard this. Justin and Janet in the car said that while Sarah and Rachel were arguing on the phone in the McDonald's parking lot, they ended up to make their way over to Javier's and confront Rachel and fight her because Rachel said to Sarah on the phone, and they heard it on speaker, I am going to stab you and your Mexican boyfriend. So Janet and Dustin said that whenever Rachel said that to Sarah on speaker, it all bets were off at that point, and they went to Javier's house to find Rachel and fight her, okay? It was supposed to be a one-on-one -on -one fair fight. Now, there is two versions of what I'm about to tell you because this is where it gets super sticky, super foggy, and super sketchy, okay? The fact of the matter is we will never know what version of the story is the truth. We, I mean, like, we literally just will not. Unless there's a hidden camera, some footage is going to pop up from somewhere, we will never know. So I'm going to give you both versions, and then I'm going to tell you what has been proven in court and what we know happened for sure. And you can take whatever version of the story you believe to be the beginning part and roll with it. But I'm going to tell you what is factual after I tell you the two versions, okay? The first version is Dustin and Janet's version from the minivan, okay? They said they went to go witness the fight that was supposed to be between Rachel and Sarah one-on-one -on -one and fair. But when they pulled up to Javier's house so that Sarah could get out of the car and fight, they say that Rachel rushed the car, rushed the driver's side door, yanked it open, and two times quickly stabbed Sarah as they tussled a little bit. Sarah fell to the ground. End of version A, okay? Version B is Javier and Rachel's version. Rachel says when they pulled up that Sarah was driving in such a way that the minivan was going right at her as if to hit her or run her over and she had to basically jump out of the way. Javier does not say anything about this point. He said he doesn't remember much about that part. However, they both say that after Rachel jumped out of the way that Sarah flew out of the car, flung the door open, flew out of the car, came rushing towards Rachel. Janet also flew out of the car and was also rushing towards Rachel, but a few steps behind Sarah. When Sarah and Rachel made contact, that they were violently swinging and tussling with each other. Javier and Rachel say that Rachel and Sarah had each other's hair and were tugging, like tugging and tussling, and that they fell to the ground. Rachel says at this point she was wildly and blindly punching, but had the knife in her hand because she had the knife in her hand from the moment she walked out when they were going to, supposedly they were going to pull up. She always had the knife in her hand and everybody agrees to that. But it's now at this point that Rachel says she was blindly and violently punching at, at Sarah. I'm sorry. And when she was punching at Sarah, she must have hit her with the knife two quick times. Once that hit in the heart and once that hit in the shoulder. Okay. And said she got up and Sarah remained on the ground and was bleeding. Okay. So we are now at the point Sarah is on the ground bleeding. This we know for a fact. She was stabbed two times very quickly. Not super deep, but deep enough in the shoulder to where it broke skin and in the heart deep enough to where it nicked the heart. Those were the only wounds that she had. 
We also know that she was on the ground and bleeding out near the van and the van door was open. Whatever version of the story you choose to believe, that is your prerogative, y'all. And, you know, I think maybe the truth personally is somewhere in the middle. I think y'all probably agree with me because I, I, like I said, I feel connected to y'all already. And I feel like you guys probably think a lot like me. That's why we vibe. But I just feel like the story is probably, I mean, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. You know, because it always, that's always how it is. It lies somewhere in the middle. So, nonetheless, at this point, she is on the ground and Sarah is bleeding. But if you want to know what Rachel had to say directly, this is it right here. Let me tell you guys one thing real quick. These are only short clips of her interrogation. In the description box below is the link to the full interrogation video. I don't have time to put it all in here. This thing will be three hours long as y'all already know I can talk like forever and I need to do better with my lengthy videos but I just want y'all to know that if you want to watch it it's down there in the description box and it is pretty interesting but this is a short clip of what she had to say about the moment that Sarah pulled up in the minivan. I asked you why you just didn't run into the house when they come pulling up in a van your response to me was what? I don't know I'm tired of running and being scared I don't want to hurt anybody I don't my parents did not well, raise did me that night. Okay, I know that, but you I did not have any intention on stabbing her. You had the knife in your hand. How do you think that blade came in contact with her? You said she was, was like trying to trying hit you. To hit her back. Okay, well, how do you hit somebody with a knife in your hand? You're gonna have to show me. So yeah, because I know they're gonna jump me. I know Josh's family. Josh has hit me before. Josh's brother's threatened to hit me before. Do you have a gun or anything else? No. Okay, so that was your form of protection. Okay, so, mm -hmm. And they were all screaming at me, and Janet was telling me I was crazy and I wasn't going to do anything, and then, like, she said that she wished I would stab her. At this point, Rachel says that Janet attacked her, gave her a fat lip, and scratched her, okay? I don't really believe at this point anyone knew the severity of what was going on with Sarah because it was just two punctures, and nobody knew she was really on the verge of death at this point. So after that happened and Janet had given her fat lip and scratched her a little bit, Rachel walked away, threw the knife onto a neighbor's roof. I don't think she meant to throw it on the roof. I think she just chucked it and it happened to land on a roof, okay? And then went and sat on Javier's front porch. Now at this point, neighbor said that she literally spoke the words out of her mouth, I'm done. So after she chucked the knife, she's walking away towards the porch and she says the words, I'm done. Whether she says that or not, nobody will ever know because she doesn't remember and witnesses say yes, but who knows. If she said I'm done, I don't literally think she meant I'm done as in I'm done with the killing. I think she probably meant I'm done as in like, um, like a catchphrase. You know how when people are like, I'm done, like I'm done with you type of thing. I think she probably meant that. And when you guys, let me just disclaimer here, okay? When I tell you guys I think that this is what she meant and it's kind of seems like I'm saying it in her defense, I am not friends with her and we do not get along and I do not like her at all. I do not like her from prison and I do not like her for several reasons. We almost got into a physical altercation on two different occasions. And then we were also very good friends and bunkies. And I tell y'all that this is what I think happened and it's something that seems to be defending her. It's hard for me to say it because I don't like the girl and I feel bad for her parents because she has the wool so far over their eyes. It's ridiculous, but we're not getting into that right now. I'll get into that at the end. So as she sits on the porch and she's thrown the knife and maybe said the words, I'm done. This part is also a little sketchy because we don't really know who Josh found out from, but even though Sarah did pass away, she was able to somehow crawl to her cell phone, which could explain why she was next to her car door. They said she was next to her car door because Rachel rushed the car, didn't even give her a chance to fight, and immediately stabbed her two times. But there was a blood trail and she had crawled back to the car to get herself in to call Josh, which was proven, then collapsed after she'd spoken with Josh and told him that she actually was stabbed and she thought it might be something bad. So 
that's why she was by her car door. And I think that was kind of effed up that they used that as her position, like where she got stabbed, because clearly the blood shows that she moved from very far away from the car all the way to the car door and used her cell phone because there's a phone call. Rachel says she doesn't remember if she called Josh or not. She may have. And Janet says that she did also call Josh. So at this point, all three girls have called Josh. And all three girls have told Josh now, possibly at least two, if not three, that, you know, she has been stabbed, there has been a fight, so on and so forth. And at that point, he calls the police, and this is what is said. Where is the person that stabbed them? She's on the floor. The person that stabbed them. She's right here too. Where are they? They this. She's right here in the driveway. Where is the knife at now? She's in her hand. They're fighting. We gotta hurry up and get here quick. Sir, sir, they're already on the way. This isn't falling down at all. Hey, the phone for the police department. Back up. Did you guys hear in the call how he said they tried to jump her? So at this point. Josh has called the police. They're on their way. He runs the two blocks to Sarah's parents' house and he knocks on the door and he tells her father, I mean, he actually did a noble thing for once. And he tells her father that she has been hurt and they get in the car and drive the two blocks back to Javier's house. When they get to Javier's house, Sarah is now surrounded by police officers. She's getting put in the ambulance and she is getting taken to the hospital where she does pass away from the stab wound to the heart. So while this is going on, they are trying to piece this all together, see if it really was self-defense. You know, she's sitting on the front porch, so it's not like she went anywhere. Um, she's not acting like someone who premeditated and executed a vicious and horrific murder, right? And there really wasn't any signs that this even was that. So Rachel has now told them that she was simply trying to defend herself, that she threw the knife afterwards. It was just something she did. She doesn't know why. And there's several versions of this story going around, but all they know is that now she has gone to the hospital and passed away. Now, everyone at the crime scene, including and most importantly Rachel, does not know she has passed away because when she left, when Sarah was put in the ambulance, she was very much alive. I mean, remember guys, she had just crawled to the minivan and actually placed a phone call, not to police, not to her parents, but to Josh. Even in her dying moments, okay, this girl still chose to call Josh. That is how much of a hold he had on her. He had such a hold on these two young ladies that one chose to kill over him. She had that much rage and fury. She wanted to keep him that badly that she stabbed another human being with enough force to hit the heart. And the other one, in her dying moments, decided to call him and let him know what was going on instead of her loving parents and instead of the police for help. That says a lot about the brainwashing that Josh was doing and how effective he really was at brainwashing these girls. I mean, can y'all imagine that? Like, literally imagine that. This girl is dying right then and there. She may not know it, but she is. And she calls this douchebag instead of the police for help. Like, wow, y'all, that's crazy. I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, but is that not crazy? So, nonetheless... The police take Rachel in. They don't officially arrest her right there on the spot, but they detain her and they take her to the police station. Mind you guys, she does not know that Sarah has died. This is what she said in the interrogation interview when she found out that Sarah had passed away. You're going to have to help me out with this because when everybody got there, Sarah is laying in the middle of the street with the stab wound. How do you not see that? I didn't get Janet came after me. Like, she physically came after me and dragged me around his front yard. Mm -hmm. I didn't see anything. Okay. I just didn't see. Like, I saw Sarah sitting, like, on the edge of the seat of the front of the van. Mm -hmm. And she was screaming at Janet to get in the car. And then after that, Janet just came after me. She would not stop. And Javier and Dustin kind of, like, followed us. Mm -hmm. And I guess, I, like, I did not mean to stop her at all. How many times did you stab her? I guess once. Okay, do you know where it hit her at? No, I don't. I didn't see anything. I had both of them coming at me and Sarah hitting me to begin with. All right. The next piece of information that you need to know is that she is dead. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. She, 
left eye result of these stab wounds that she had at Northside Hospital. <laughs> I didn't know that. He didn't stop. And he just wanted me to leave me alone. All of this over Josh? I just didn't want them to terrorize me anymore. They follow me everywhere. They come to my job. They come to my house. Well, she's not, not going to follow you anymore because she's dead now. <laughs> So after the interrogation and after all of this, she is placed under arrest for capital felony first degree premeditated murder, okay? Now, Rachel at this point is still clinging to her self-defense story. Now, there's something I want to point out in her self-defense story. Let me play back for you this one snippet of tape that is actually recorded when Josh called 911. When he called 911, listen to what he says when he says they tried to jump her, she was just defending herself, talking about Rachel and talking about how Sarah and Janet and the others went to actually go jump Rachel. He says the story right there and he says exactly what Rachel is saying. Listen to this. Or they're on the way, the police are on the way, just tell me what happened. Um, they tried, they tried to jump her. She pulled out her pocket knife, trying to defend herself. By the time we got to them, by the time we got to them, she was already stabbed. She was okay. on the floor. She was stabbed in the chest. Stabbed in the chest? Yeah. Okay, just stay on the phone with me, okay? Right. Where's the Where's the knife now, sir? Um, I, I, I have no idea. Okay. Try not to, okay, if you find it, don't touch it. The officer's on the way. Just stay on the phone with me a minute. So as you can see, even though he's mumbling and fast talking, he's telling the story. He knew that they were going to go jump Rachel and all attack her at once. He knew that she was defending herself. Was it right that she pulled the knife out and took it with her and stabbed her? No. But what she was saying at the very least was true. Even though I don't think she planned this murder out and, you know, premeditated everything, she did have the knife. It was wrong. And she did freakishly happen to stab her in a place that was just irreparable. I mean, it hit her heart and that was the end of it. It's, it's so sad because it's like something that wasn't supposed to happen, but it was, you know, it was just really, really a terrible situation that she hit her in that area. And everyone is, besides Josh, is really a victim. During the court proceedings, the prosecution used all of Rachel's communications to Sarah against her. Now, I don't think this was right. I think that Rachel should be in prison and she should have some sort of sentence, but I don't think that was right because a lot of those messages, a lot of the texts that you will see, a lot of the ones that I played for you that you guys heard that said, I'm going to kill you, I'm going to murder you, Guys, those messages were eight months before the actual murder happened. Eight months before it actually happened, these messages were recorded. It's just that Sarah saved them and her parents were able to get into her phone and listen to the messages. So they played all of these messages for the jury so that they could see that, hey, this was a premeditated murder, but they did not tell them that they were eight months old. So that was a little unfair in my book because it looked like, wow, she said she was going to do it and she did. This is a side note. I don't know if you guys believe in this or not. I hope I don't like creep you out, but I really believe in the law of attraction, the power of positive thinking and manifestation. I really believe if you constantly say something and keep repeating it and keep, you know, driving that point in that you will make it happen and you will make conscious or subconscious decisions to actually get yourself to that point. So by Rachel continuing to say, oh, I'm going to kill you. Oh, I'm going to murder you. Oh, I'm going to stab you to death. Oh, I'm going to this. Oh, I'm going to that. She really was gearing her steps in life towards that direction and that end game and that goal, even if she didn't really mean it. So be careful what you say, guys, okay? Because what you say, your words have power and your words really could turn into the reality because you manifested it by telling yourself that this is what's going to happen. Rachel said repeatedly, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to murder you. And even though I don't think for one second she ever meant to do that, that's exactly what she kept telling her own self.
And just like if I sit here and look at this camera and say, this camera is a dog, this camera is a dog, this camera is a dog, eventually my brain might start thinking this camera is a dog. I mean, it's been proven in interrogation, you know, videos and studies and statistics all the time. When they sit down someone who is innocent in a room and constantly say, you are guilty, you are guilty, you are guilty. You watch innocent people over and over again start to fabricate stories and admit to crimes that they never even committed. Why? Because it is constantly being put in their head and it's constantly being said that they are guilty. Manifestation is real, y'all. Please, you guys, I, I really care about y'all because I thank you guys for support and encouragement and the last thing I want you guys to ever do is manifest something bad in your life so if you're going to constantly repeat things make them positive make them positive affirmations because what you say those words have power and they hold weight they really do okay that was a side note I don't want to go down a rabbit hole because I will but nonetheless let me tell you this Rachel was found guilty of second degree murder they used all those tapes against her they used everything against her they could and they found her guilty and she got 27 years in prison at the age of 20. Now, I want to say this because there are a lot of people that feel like that was way too much time. Rachel, and I know she showed me her paperwork, she was offered eight years in prison. Eight years the state offered her if she just took the guilty plea but she wanted to stand by her self-defense claim so badly and she wanted to be found not guilty and be acquitted so badly that she didn't take the plea and she rolled the dice and took her case to trial. And because she was found guilty, they had a guideline which they had to give her. Wade had claimed self-defense and was hoping for an acquittal or at least a manslaughter charge, but that was not the case. The prosecution did use 18 months worth of communications, text messages, emails, social media messages, and basically every voicemail that Rachel had ever left Sarah. That had a lot to do with her conviction, the words that she used and the things that she said. Even though it was over an 18 month period, they did make it look like it was all strategically planned and plotted out, which I think we kind of know that that's just not what happened. So, you know, for killing somebody, 27 years isn't that much. And even though I don't think that it was premeditated and I think it was a horrible accident, a horrible, stupid accident gone terribly wrong, 27 years is really kind of on the low end of what they could have given her because somebody did lose their life here and that young lady lost her life over absolutely nothing. So, you know, Rachel really should be grateful that she didn't get a 50 year or a life sentence because she very well could have, could have in the state of Florida. But I want you to also remember if you feel bad for her, she really could have taken that eight years. She would have been out of prison right now today. She would have already been home, okay? She didn't take the eight years, and let me tell you guys why I don't feel bad for Rachel. I can stand behind the notion that this was a horrible mistake and an accident over a stupid boy that had charmed the wits out of both of these young, innocent, naive girls and brainwashed and said all kinds of sweet nut things in their ears and just got them to do all this stupid stuff. I can stand behind all of that, okay? What I can't stand behind is, if that is the case, Rachel would have changed in prison. Now, let me tell you guys what I saw in prison. Rachel got to prison, in the county actually, but I'm just going to start with in prison. And she literally jumped into lesbian relationships immediately. She came to prison in a relationship that she started in the county jail, okay? She has relationship after relationship after relationship with women in prison over and over and over again. She has tattooed names of several women in prison that she's been in relationship with on her body over and over again. She has physically fought several women in prison about love triangles with other women in prison. Her and I met because she confronted me because the girl that she was with actually had a crush on me and was talking about it and I didn't know that that's what was going on. We you know, talked it out and got everything sorted out and we were fine. And I realized, you know what, this really isn't a bad girl. And I became friends with her. We ended up moving one on top of the other. I slept on top of her on the top bunk. She slept on the bottom. We became very close. But I realized very quickly that Rachel was not only a really serious, like, liar, like, habitual liar, um, 
But I also realized that the same reason that she got to prison is the same reason that she is still getting into problems in prison, okay? And I can tell you right now that Rachel will literally stab her best friend in the back, no pun intended, um, over a relationship. She has her parents send money to her girlfriends in prison just to make them happy. She shares everything she has with these girlfriends in prison just to keep them. Because in prison, a big way to keep your girlfriend happy, especially a stud, and a stud is a girl that looks more like a guy, is the dominant role in the relationship. A stud in prison will many times be taken care of by the more feminine girl. So she has Janet and... Barry in contact with several studs, the dominant one in the relationship, she has them on these other women's accounts in prison so that she can keep in contact with them if they get separated in prisons. Janet will regularly send messages to these girlfriends and ex-girlfriends of Rachel in prison and let these girls know, hey, Rachel said she loves you. She just wanted you to know. Um, send them money on behalf of Rachel and things like that. Rachel will get jobs so that she can have extra perks so that she can make her girlfriends happy. And basically her entire world in prison is completely consumed with people pleasing, being accepted, being wanted and desired by other women in there who are studs and being in these relationships with these women. That mindset of wanting to be loved and desired so badly, she still has to this day and that has not changed. That is why I have a problem with Rachel because I know for a fact that the very thing and the very mindset that got her in trouble is something that she has not gotten rid of yet. She has not shook that mindset. She still very much has it to the point that her parents are, are her Janet is on people's accounts, their email accounts, because we have JPay in prison where we have accounts that we can email people. Janet, her mother, is on several studs email accounts just so that Rachel can keep up with them. Like, that's nutty to me. You should be in prison really better in your life and yourself, not worrying about what some girlfriend that you had in prison is doing at a whole nother prison. Okay? Um, I know that Rachel is a big liar when it comes to relationship issues. And that is the thing. Most of her flaws come in the context of relationships. Like she will like somebody and go tell that person, hey, your girlfriend is cheating on you with X, Y, and Z just so she can get that person to like her and be with her. She doesn't lie much outside of that realm. I watched her do a lot of shady flaw shit, but only in the context of relationships and getting these studs to like her or to stay with her or to be with her and it was very frustrating and very weird her and I had another incident where she basically was saying things about me that were not true and I was very very pissed off so I confronted her about it and she had a very smug and snide attitude so I got a little heated and, um, you know, basically we had an argument and that was that. But she just, I could see the good in Rachel, but there is this deep-seated and deep-rooted nastiness that I can't look past. And a lot of what I just said is my opinion of her based on my experiences with her, therefore making it my reality. Others might not think that. If you want to get just to the meat of the matter, we can just say that, yes, 27 years might be a very long time for someone so young who really probably just committed a horrible, horrible accident. However, do not negate or overlook the fact that she was offered eight years, which is less time than I got. I had burglary and I got 10 years. She got offered eight and she took someone's life, accident or not and she turned it down. She appealed it, she went back to court, but they did not overturn her conviction and she was sent back to prison with her same 27 year sentence. Um, as far as how she is viewed in prison by others, 
uh, Rachel is a well-kept girl. She has good hygiene. She keeps herself up. She wears makeup. Um, she has gotten several tattoos on her body in prison. She has dibbled and dabbled in drugs. She does, you know, do some things she shouldn't be doing. Um, she always has relatively good jobs because she's fairly well-spoken. And... As far as anything weird, one thing I thought was kind of creepy when we were friends is she has a picture of Sarah in her folder. In one of her legal folders, she has a big blown up like Xerox picture of Sarah's face. And she pulled it out one time and showed it to me and I was like, this is odd. I was like, why do you have that, Rach? And she was like, it just makes me remember, you know, I don't know. I just, I feel like close to her somehow and I don't feel as bad about what happened when I look at it. I don't really understand what that means. I thought it was personally a little freaking creepy, but nonetheless, that did happen. And, um, she also did, oh, this was like one of the lies that she told me. I asked her if she had any kids before she came to prison. And, um, even though she was fairly young, I just was wondering, we were just making conversation when we were getting to know each other. And she said she did. Janet and Barry come and visit Rachel almost every other weekend or so. A lot of her money and her financial support does come from Sugar Daddies. She is on a lot of pen pal websites. You can find her picture in her case many places. She gets a lot of money from men that, you know, are fans. And um, she does actually have a lot of social media platforms up with people that are trying to help her. Okay, because a lot of people just look at the outside, the, you know, the shell of the case and feel bad for the 27 year sentence without knowing that she was offered eight and that she is in prison doing the exact same shit that she did at home that got her in prison. If they knew what I knew and saw everything I saw her do, they wouldn't feel bad for her because she hasn't changed one bit. Rachel is a very good actress. She can cry at the drop of a hat. She can really make you empathetic and feel like she is actually very much struggling and she is actually a just a very good actress, okay? I saw her do this many of times to get out of trouble in prison. I started to probe a little more. I was like, well, where's the baby, you know? Like, what, why don't you have any pictures? Why don't you talk about the baby or anything? Like, almost five full years after she's been in prison, I don't mean to laugh, it's just so freaking weird. Out there as hell, man. I told y'all, she's nutty. She told me that she was pregnant when she got to the county, which was really weird because I was pregnant when I got to the county and had just told her that. And it kind of felt like, y'all, this is really weird, but it kind of felt like she was telling me my own story. I was pregnant when I went to the county. I had my baby, my first and only son, in the county jail, and then I went to prison. She, after I told her that, then told me that she was also pregnant. Almost five full years after being in prison and after Sarah's death, she pulls out a picture of Josh and a little baby girl that looks like she's maybe like two in a pool and or by a pool. And she says that is her that is her daughter's father, that she had her daughter in the county jail when they found out she was going to get 27 years, that he took the baby from her, forced her to sign parental rights over, like to terminate the parental rights and because she had so much time and the baby would be over 18 when she got home and they didn't want to put the baby girl through that and then went ahead and proceeded to never bring her baby around so i'm looking at her i'm like oh that guy's so mean what a jerk like that's crazy he shouldn't have done that you know what i mean he should have at least you know given you the opportunity to see pictures or whatever even if he didn't want to bring her up here like don't just never let you see her again. If they don't want to expose a little girl to prison, that's fine, but like at least let you see some pictures or something, you know what I mean? And I'm feeling bad for her. Come to find out it was freaking Josh, his baby that he had with that other girl way in the beginning, and it had nothing to do with Rachel at all. So that was a little bit creep, y'all. That was a lot creep. But nonetheless, like I said, Rachel probably wanted to connect with me in that moment. She has that serious issue of people pleasing. And just like her mom said, she has an issue with boy craziness and even girl craziness now because that's the environment that she's in to the point that she will do anything to keep the people that she forms these bonds with in her life. She has that stalker stage five clinger thing. It's a fatal attraction type stuff. And I'm telling y'all, 
I can really see this being a problem for her when she gets home. And it has been almost 10 years now since this happened. Well, it's been over 10 years, but it's been 10 years since she's been in prison. It's been 12 years since this happened. And the girl hasn't changed, man. I'm telling y'all she hasn't. And nonetheless, y'all, that is the deadly teenage love triangle between Rachel Wade, Josh, and Sarah. Um, I spent all of my time with Rachel Wade at Lowell. She was gone for about a two-year period to the reception center. And when she did come back, we were on the annex and the main unit together most of the entire time. So I have a very good scope of who she is, what she does, and how she acts. And I can tell you guys right now, I'm sure she feels bad. I feel like she does. When we were friends, she did tell me she felt bad. But when she pulled the picture out of Sarah and looked at it, I was creeped out. So we stopped talking about it and I never brought it up again. I'm very sorry for Sarah's family. They lost their only child whom they love very much. I'm sorry for Janet and Barry that their daughter really is still continuing to take advantage of them and playing this good girl role when really that's not what she's doing in prison and that their only child as well was, you know, sent to prison and turned out to be the way Rachel is. And it's just a really tragic situation because remember, guys, that anyone can hide behind a keyboard and a computer screen and bully and shout out all these threats, but you don't ever know what it's going to escalate to. So if you're in that situation, please, I beg y'all, just stop. It's not worth it. That guy that you might be fighting over, that girl that you might be beefing over, they won't be a faint memory in five years, okay? It's not worth it. So... That is the story, y'all. Please watch your words. They do manifest. Words have power. If you have any kind of cyberbullying or anything going on behind a keyboard, guys, cut it out. It's not worth it. It's not worth your life. You never know where someone else's mindset is. And, um, you know, just be careful, okay? No guy is worth it. No girl is worth it. No one is worth your life. I love y'all so much. Unless it's your kid. Your kid's worth their life, okay? Just saying. But... I love y'all. I appreciate y'all. I thank y'all for the encouragement. I thank y'all for the tips. Oh my God, I've been so, so encouraged with what you guys have been telling me in the comments. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. I have like 90 subscribers, ah! which is great for me right now. It's great. Okay. So anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this. I will see you a little later in this week with a prison story. And um, I love y'all so much. Have a good one. See y'all later. If you guys enjoyed this video, please give me a thumbs up. I will really appreciate it. Every thumbs up counts. If you like my channel, subscribe. Every subscription counts. It's a free way for you to help me, but it does go a super, super long way with every single click count. So, again, 